Good evening, government officials, distinguished guests, members of industry, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Cody Adam, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to this instalment of the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade's New Colombo Plan Momentum Series presented by Telstra and Emphasis tonight, focusing on digital inclusion within Australia and across the Indo-Pacific region. This event is taking place on Gadigal land of the Eora Nation, and I'd like to pay my respects to the elders of this land, past, present, and still to come, and acknowledge their continual co connection and contribution to land, water, and culture today. I'd like to extend this welcome to any First Nations people in attendance this evening at the beautiful Telstra Customer Insights Centre or online via our live stream. By way of introduction, I was fortunate enough to be a 2019 New Colombo Plan Mobility Grant recipient for Indonesia. I travelled to Jakarta while I was completing a Bachelor of Accounting in the Co-op Scholarship Program at the University of Technology in Sydney. I'm now in the final semester of a Master of Business Administration and Entrepreneurship, also at UTS, and the co-founder of Snack, which is a mobile-first app that enables educators to create bite-sized videos in a format that uses 98% less data than conventional video. It's an honor to welcome and introduce our distinguished guests and panelists this evening. Lyndall Stoyles is Telstra's Group General Counsel and Group Executive for Sustainability, External Affairs, and Legal. Lyndall has a passion for breaking down barriers and prejudices, creating opportunities for inclusion, and building diverse teams, which has led, her, led to her involvement in organizations supporting the Indigenous community and asylum seekers. Andrew Groth is the Senior Vice President, Region Head of Australia and New Zealand, and Industry Head for Financial Services in the Asia-Pacific region at Emphasis. Andrew is a visionary and authentic leader who is passionate about encouraging Australia's youth to build digital careers and develop their STEM skills. He also chairs the Emphasis CSR program in Australia in, and New Zealand called Pathways. Bruce Maguire, who is joining us online today, is the lead policy advisor for Vision Australia and plays a key role in the development of the organisation's public policy positions on issues that affect people who are blind or have low vision. Bruce continues to play a key advisory role and works with government, industry and the broader disability sector on topics such as access to information, access to the built environment and access to new and emerging technologies. I would now like to invite Michael Bergman, the director of the New Colombo Plan from the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade to share his introductory remarks and open the session for us tonight. Thank you, Michael. Okay. Thanks, Cody. Hi, evening everyone. Um, thanks, Cody. Uh, I'd also like to acknowledge the Gadigal of the Eora Nation, the traditional custodians of the land, and pay my respects to their elders both past and present. As Cody said, my name is Michael Bergman. I'm the director of the uh, New Colombo Plan, a uh, fantastic Australian government initiative, which I hope you all uh, know that already. Uh, and a warm welcome to our NCP community here, uh, around the country, across the Indo-Pacific, including our NCP business champions, NGOs, business and academic partners, and of course, alumni and current scholars. Having been part of the NCP team for a number of years now, I've had the privilege of working with many NCP supporters who have worked tirelessly supporting and promoting the NCP program, as well as mentoring, nurturing, and very importantly, employing our NCP scholars and alumni. And the NCP is all about connecting a new generation of Australians with the Indo-Pacific. We normally do this by sending scholars out to the region for long-term immersive experiences and supporting Australian universities to deliver shorter-term targeted mobility programs. Uh, and we have a vibrant alumni community, and again, great to see some of you here with us today. Inclusion has been a central part of the NCP from the beginning. The NCP is for all young Australian undergraduates, and we work hard to support access to the program from students from regional, remote communities, low socioeconomic backgrounds, students with disability, just to name a few. But of course, we haven't been sending too many students out to the region lately, which is where momentum comes in. And the success of Momentum in 2020, at the height of the COVID crisis, 
is down to that invaluable contribution from the business community and academic partners and thought leaders who willingly share their knowledge, their expertise and their time to support the NCP community and to support uh, the objectives of DFAT and the Australian government. So again, thank you all for your support. And the contributions of Infosys and Telstra clearly demonstrate the value of collaboration between government, NCP uh, and our business partners. Uh, so again, thank you to, to Lindell and the Telstra team for your support uh, now and of course in 2020. Um, and Lindell, your, your contributions at the Beyond the Glass Ceiling panel discussion, uh, why we need more women leaders, is a session that's still talked about. We've still got lots of uh, interest in, in that and whether we're going to do something very similar soon. Thank you, Andrew, and all of the Infosys team for sponsoring 10 2021 scholars for the NCP, uh, the NCP Momentum series itself, and for investing valuable intellectual capital in supporting the NCP program. Um, and I'd also like to acknowledge the contribution, contribution of Bruce McGuire from Vision Australia, uh, and it'll be great to hear about Bruce's rich, diverse, and fascinating experiences given his expertise on topics relating to access to information, access to the built environment, and access to new and emerging technologies. And once again, thanks to Cody, co-founder of Snack, NCP alumni, for sharing today's session. And Cody's own NCP journey experiences and entrepreneurial success is itself a fascinating story. Um, very quickly, before we dive in and hear from our speakers, I just want to share one very quick personal perspective on the issues of inclusion, access, and adoption. Uh, prior to uh, working for Foreign Affairs and Trade, in my early career, I worked for the Australian Electoral Commission. And as all Australians would know, federal elections can be called at any time. They're delivered across all of Australia, our external territories, and then working with my foreign affairs colleagues, open to all Australians in all corners of the world. And they're compulsory. Uh, my American friends couldn't believe that us rugged, individualistic Aussies would, in their view, meekly bow our heads and be forced to go to the polls. I'd explain that inclusion plays a massive part. The government and the AEC work very hard to make the process as inclusive as possible, but recognise that many parts of the community will still face challenges in participating. Australians are generally okay with doing their bit, even being compelled to, as long as it's simple, easy to access, easy to understand, and preferably a sausage is involved somewhere. But I won't go into the issues of digital inclusion, uh, online voting, other digital electoral services. Guaranteed our uh, expert speakers here today will be far more interesting. But as a semi-reformed election nerd, be very happy to talk at length uh, at networking later. So without further ado, I would uh, love to welcome you all to our third uh, NCP Momentum session for this series, which promises to be another very exciting discussion. Thank you again, and over to you, Cody. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. Awesome. So to set some context for our topic this evening, I'd like to begin with a quote from Sir Timothy John Berners-Lee who is the computer scientist best known as the inventor of the World Wide Web. As we move toward a highly connected world, it is critical that the web be usable by everyone, regardless of individual capabilities and disabilities. The recent COVID challenges, combined with the rapid pace of globalization and technological advancements, many would argue now is the time to reimagine our future, where together we, governments, academia, the private and NGO and small business sectors must mobilize our collective resources, intellectual capital, capital, and look outside our industry silos to create opportunities for one and all in our communities, irrespective of their abilities. We are fortunate tonight to have a panel of true thought leaders in the digital inclusion space sharing their valuable insights and experiences with us. There will be opportunity for questions following this discussion. And to begin, I'd like to ask you, Lyndall, if you would share your perspective on why it's important for corporates to focus on digital inclusion and how do corporates contribute to the creation of and then leverage Indo-Pacific ecosystem to improve digital inclusion as a whole? Thanks, Cody. Um... I think if I start from the perspective of what corporates get out of digital inclusion, and I think it's pretty clear that corporates get a lot. So whether that's a reduction in costs or an increase in efficiencies or a whole, in our case, a revenue stream. Um, and because we benefit so much from digital inclusion, I think that means that we should 
um, also think about the impacts and the harm that we can cause if we don't include everyone. And that's particularly relevant at Telstra, um, where our purpose is to build a connected future for everyone to thrive. And that's everyone. It's not just the minority, I'm sorry, majority. It's not just people who live in urban areas or people with particular skills. It's a purpose of trying to drive that connection so that everyone can thrive. And if we look sort of outside, um, or we look at our Australian experience and look outside, you can see that there are really particular challenges that our region experiences. So both within it, there's a disparity of wealth within our country, and there's a disparity of wealth and opportunities across our region. And that is made worse, that's being made worse by, you know, factors like climate change where, you know, a lot of countries in our region are feeling that full force and impact of climate change that is exacerbating this disparity between wealth and inclusion in our region. And then you've got sort of natural geographic issues of topography and things like that. So whether you're looking at the highlands of New Guinea or the underpopulated areas of Australia, there's particular challenges there for digital inclusion and we're confronted with them every day. Um, so what does that all mean? Um, I think it means uh, that we all have a role to play. Corporates absolutely have a role to play, but we can't actually do it on our own. We don't actually have all of the research, all of the information to do it on our own, but there are things that we do do. And I think our region presents, while it's got those challenges, it presents real opportunities. Those challenges actually present really novel opportunities for us to explore solutions. And I'll give you just a few examples before I get cut off. Mm -hmm. um, so one of them is uh, Telstra funded many years ago in 2016, the Cerebral Palsy Alliance started up in a remarkable accelerator program, which was specifically designed to get the seed funding and the skills and tools that Telstra and others contributed to fund um, digital startups that focused on particular issues of dis disability. So it was specifically focused on how you could tackle some of those issues and provide better inclusion. And now we look at it, they've funded more than 30 digital disability um, startups um, in a very broad range of fields. Another example within Telstra is our Helix community. Um, so this is an internal community that was set up by um, our people who love data and analytics and all of that sort of stuff. And there's an eight, 800 people who are members of Helix. Um, and they got together to actually basically, the primary purpose was to improve data literacy across Telstra. Um, and digital data literacy in particular, what they then realised was that there was this huge pool of talent and knowledge. And so they created this um, virtual volunteering program where they go into not-for-profits and they help the not-for-profits with their particular data issues. And those virtual teams are made up of people from Australia, India and Philippines, all of the key jurisdictions in which we operate. If, Andrew, you could share your perspective on where we should focus our efforts to improve digital inclusion within Australia and then contribute to a broader Indo-Pacific ecosystem. Okay, thanks, Cody. And look, I'll, I'll talk about Australia first and I just think a little bit of context. Um, you know, the Australian government has put forward a vision that says uh, we want to be a leading digital economy in Australia by 2030. Uh, and in fact, I've had the great pleasure of working on a, a digital and telecommunications uh, committee, which is chaired by Andy Penn, uh, looking at that. And so, you know, that aspiration is important. And if you want to be a, a digital leading economy, it's clearly got to have all aspects of inclusion to, to do that. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a lofty aspiration, um, but I know there's a lot of focus from, you know, Telstra and Infosys and many other organisations working with the government uh, to, to, to try and get there. And I think there's three, three key areas. There's digital literacy, digital skills and digital access. And I'll just uh, uh, touch a little bit on the first two of those around literacy and skills. Um, you know, I'm sitting here with some fine young Australians that are part of this NCP program. But, you know, and, and I'm sure it's actually not a, a, a representation of the whole of society. But at Infosys a couple of years ago, we did a survey. Uh, it was particularly done at youth, 18 to 25 year olds. It was done all around the globe. It was done in Australia, Germany, France, UK, US, India, China, and looking at the engagement with digital technologies. And one of the findings of that was that in Australia, our youth, 18 to 25 year olds, were actually among the most digitally aware across the globe in terms of using digital technology. There's a but. 
However, they were the least interested in actually getting behind the scenes and working in, mm. in digital technology. So it actually leads me to there's a point we need to do here about cultural shift and, you know, the opportunities that digital brings and the opportunities it means for inclusion. Um, you know, if you want to, again, if you want to be a leading digital economy, we have to address that, that culture. And there are amazing opportunities and ca careers that are enabled by digital technology. And I know I don't need to tell the people sitting in this room, but as a, as a country, that's something we have to work on. And I think, you know... Um, Again, reflecting on COVID, and you know, Arun has already talked about some of the impacts, and we're in a, we are in a very fortunate situation here. But if you look at those businesses that had digital capabilities and how they survived and actually thrived during the COVID crisis, there's been some research done that those companies that had good digital platforms actually grew their revenues by six percent plus in a year when many, many were struggling to survive. And I know from customers we've worked with all around the Asia Pac region, they've said to us. Had we not done the sort of digital transformations we'd done over previous years, we would not have been able to survive that COVID environment. So it's, it's such an important thing. And I think, you know, in Australia, we were, you know, we're physically an island here, and that was part of what has been able to manage and help us be in the environment. But when you come to being a, a digital economy and a leading digital economy, you can't be a digital island. So that inclusion has to be there. And your point about working across the Indo-Pacific is really important. So, and I think, you know, organisations like Telstra and Infosys are making a big difference, can make a big difference, and we have to work with government and we have to work with academia to make that happen. And you know, that's what the NCP is all about, which is a, such a fantastic um, program. Um, I'll, I'll give a couple of examples from Infosys as well. I mean, we're working with the... Um, World Economic Forum, one of our global ESG goals, is to help ensure that 10 million people globally are able to learn digital skills that wouldn't have otherwise been able to. And in 2019, in India, we had over 15,000 um, individuals who benefited from the Infosys Foundation program to learn digital skills. So that wow. inclusivity is important. And, and bringing it right back here to Australia, um, I think there's a video, I don't know if it's going to be played later, but we have this, this program you mentioned in the introduction, Cody, called the CSR Pathways Program. And it's all about using digital technology, using education and learning to create those pathways for all of society. And it's particularly focused on the disadvantaged groups in society and building that inclusion. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's, that's awesome. Uh, the next question is for Bruce, who is online. Um, Bruce, can you hear us? And yes, can you awesome. hear me, Katie? Yes, that's great. Thank you. So Lyndall and Andrew have shared a private sector's perspective. Being lead policy advisor at Vision Australia, your views on private sector's contributions and government's role, uh, what are your views on the private sector's contributions and the government's role in a, improving digital inclusion as a whole? Well, thanks, uh, Cody. Um, and as you mentioned, I'm lead policy advisor with uh, Vision Australia. Vision Australia is the largest provider of services to uh, people who are blind or have low vision. We, we provide services each year to more than 26,500 clients. In Australia today, there are 384,000 people who are blind or have low vision. And that's estimated to increase to 564,000 by 2030. And the main reason that that's, that that's increasing so rapidly is because we have an ageing population and, and uh, blindness and vision loss are primarily associated with uh, age, as is disability in general. And when we look at the, the statistics for disability in general, we find that that uh, almost 18% of the Australian population has a disability. That's almost the equivalent to the entire population of New Zealand wow. and getting pretty close to the populations of, of, of Sydney and, and Melbourne. Now, if, if, if people with disability are excluded from the digital landscape, then it's a bit like rolling out our national broadband network, forgetting about Melbourne or only including a few suburbs uh, in Sydney. So people with disability are not on the fringes and we're not floating in a backwater and we're not in a bubble. We're at the heart of society and, and, and human experience. 
Now, government can play a very pivotal role by creating and maintaining a, a digitally inclusive landscape. One important way they can do that is by having accessible ICT procurement policies that are, are based on national and international uh, standards. Um, products and services that are purchased by governments can drive innovation and change in the private sector and an experience in other countries, particularly the, the US and, and Europe, shows that if governments uh, mandate accessibility in, in their contracts and in their, their tender documents, then over time, more digital accessibility finds its way into the private sector. But, the, but governments alone can't achieve digital inclusion and, and uh, there are contributions being made by the private sector, especially when it works in partnership with people with disabilities to co-design products and services or, or develop disability uh, uh, inclusion action plans. We, we find that there's an increasing number of national and multinationals that are investing significant resources in, in benchmarking their products against uh, accessibility standards such as the, uh, the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, which um, Tim Berners-Lee sort of uh, sort of spearheaded uh, back in the back in the late 90s, and and in fact they're they're making important contributions to the development of, of those standards because they recognise that uh, digital inclusion benefits all of us, and excluding some sections of the community will ultimately have a negative impact on all of us. Thanks, Katie. Wow, that's awesome. Thanks, Bruce. Uh, just staying with you, as the lead policy advisor at Vision Australia, what are your views on the state of digital access in Australia today? And where is Australia in this journey? And what is the role of the private sector and government to truly improve digital inclusion? Well, there's, there's many things that, that I and other people who are blind have low vision can do now that we couldn't do when I was younger. So, uh, for example, I can browse virtual supermarket aisles and I can order groceries online. I can uh, buy and read more digital books than I could ever have imagined when I was, you know, when I was a kid. Uh, I, I can do my own banking online now. I can read newspapers online. And when I was, when I was young, uh, people had to read them to me. Um, but I can't check my eligibility for the COVID-19 vaccine and find the nearest clinic because that particular web-based tool doesn't comply with the uh, accessibility guidelines. When I use an iPhone app to buy uh, groceries from one of our biggest supermarket chains, I can't pay by credit card because last year, in the middle of the uh, COVID pandemic, when people with disability felt most vulnerable and excluded, that particular supermarket chain made a change to their iPhone app, which made the credit card uh, payment process completely inaccessible for those of us who use the, the voiceover screen reader, which is, uh, which is in every iPhone off the shelf. And they, they still haven't fixed it. And in fact, when, whenever I and other people who are blind or low vision visit a new website or download a new app, whether it's from government or the private sector, we can never be sure if it's going to be accessible to us. Sometimes we have to use five different web browsers and four different screen reading programs to find a combination that gives us access to the features we want to use on the website or in the app, and sometimes there isn't uh, any combination that works. So I think of the digital inclusion journey as a mountain range and we've definitely climbed some of the mountains and we've stood on their summits and we've remembered where we've been and we've, we're, we're proud of what we've achieved. But the highest mountains and the fastest flowing rivers in between them are still ahead of us. If we're to climb those mountains and cross the rivers and ford the streams, then we must have a whole of society and a whole of life commitment to putting disability at the front and centre of everything that we do in the digital space. Governments must lead the way with uh, robust accessible ICT procurement policies and other mechanisms 
for making sure that all uh, government digital products and, and services are accessible, including uh, vaccine eligibility checkers. And the private sector has a generational responsibility to use its knowledge and skills and resources to remove the digital inclusion barriers that they have uh, in, you know, helped to, uh, to create and, and to make sure that their websites and apps and digital products and services are accessible so that the digital space becomes barrier free and uh, uh, fully um, inclusive. The d digital inclusion for people with disabilities is achievable. We've got the technology, we've got the knowledge, we've got the skill, and together we've got the resources. The barriers that get in the way are all created by people and they can only be eliminated by people who always say no to exclusion and, and yes to inclusion. We're all people, regardless of which sector we uh, operate in, and so we can all be part of the solution. The digital landscape is ours and it will be as inclusive as we want it to be. Thanks, Cathy. Wow, thank you, Bruce. Such a powerful message and an awesome call to action for us in the room, I think. It's certainly an area which I don't have much awareness in and I think, um, yeah, it's definitely a huge area. Um, to bring the conversation back in the room, I'd love both Lyndall and Andrew for you to share your perspective and reflecting on, on Bruce's comments, um, share the role of the private sector to create an environment that supports people with a disability in Australia and potentially contribute to build a more equitable Indo-Pacific. Can you also comment on the role of the government and academia as well as the private sector uh, on this issue? Who do you want yeah, to Andrew, first. Yep. Yeah. Okay, sure. Um, so, and thank you, Bruce, that was incredible. And yeah, Bruce talked there about the statistic 18% of the population. So you think about that, you know, just about one in five people in Australia have some form of, of disability. Um, the other interesting stat um, that I've seen is if you look at the employment situation of the working age population, those who have a disability are twice as likely to be unemployed as those who don't have a disability. So it is a big challenge. I agree with Bruce, we've climbed the, the first mountain, but we've got plenty of mountains to go. Um, and there's plenty of challenge and plenty of learning, but I think there's also a significant opportunity mm. there as well. Um, you know, and, and to your point, it absolutely has to be collaborative across business, across academia, across government. And, and actually, I think there's also a role for the not-for-profits, and I'll explain some examples about that um, that, that Infosys is working on. Um, and when I, when I talk about there being an opportunity, there's a real win-win here. There's an opportunity to create income, you know, through employment opportunities, to create fulfilment, to create purpose, and to tap into the skills shortage. You know, I talked a little bit about the emphasis survey looking at, in, in my industry, in the IT industry, we have a, a, a huge shortage of talent in Australia, and there's a huge shortage in most Western countries around the world of talent in the IT industry. And it's not the only industries. There's a lot of industries in Australia that have a shortage of talent, and they're particularly suffering from it right now because of the COVID situation. We don't have the mobility of moving people around the planet like we ordinarily did. And there are some things, despite the digital technologies we've got, you need certain skills in certain places. So um, there's an opportunity to create fulfilling employment opportunities, provided we have the right digital accessibility, provided we have the right opportunities of inclusion. And there's a an opportunity to solve talent shortages that we need in areas that are important for, for the economy as a whole. So that's why I say it's a real win-win and, it, and it's a journey of learning. Um, you know, certainly when, when I look at this from an emphasis perspective, we're learning and we're lucky that we've ha we have some great partners. We're working with an organisation called A&D, a fantastic organisation. It's the Australian Network on Disability. And, you know, they've helped us in a couple of areas. One has been, first of all, around workplace accessibility. So having, whether it's the physical environment, whether it's the digital environment, having that right accessibility in place. And the second is, and, you know, Telstra uh, and Infosys, uh, as far as I know, there's 11 companies in Australia that are, have been um, credited as a digi disability confident recruiters. Mm. So that whole process of how do you create those opportunities for, for disability is, is important. Um, and a good example we've done, we have employed 
a number of high-end autism spectrum candidates who are the most outstanding young men and women who are working at our customers in really important roles. They bring fantastic skills. But if you, if you looked at that group and you went through an, an, a traditional recruiting process, mm. there's no way they could... Mm. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. So you have to adapt it. You have to have different ways of assessing skills and fit and what's suitability. But then the skills that, that these young adults have bought have been absolutely fantastic working in our quality engineering, in our test, testing areas. Um, so that's the, that's the opportunity to me. It's, yes, challenges, learning to go, but there's a big win-win opportunity. Yeah. And it's interesting, you, you say there's almost this mark that you put the, the accreditation that your organisation to be a leader in industry. And I think that's something that all organisations should look to to become accredited, um, that they are they provide opportunities in a fair way. Um, and that's that's admirable. Yeah, yeah and I think, and, and you know, it, it, yes, it's great to have the accreditation, but actually what it is, it's that learning journey. Yep. How do you take the journey to get from the first mountain that Bruce spoke? How do we go from Kosciuszko to Everest? Mm. Yeah, it's a learning journey. Thank you. Awesome. Uh, Linda, would you like to expand? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, and I'm, I'm still stuck on uh, Bruce's analogy as well of the mountain and the river. Yeah. <laughs> it, says, it says so much. Um, and when I think about it from Telstra's perspective, we're seeing absolutely enormous growth in um, digitisation across the economy. And that is just absolutely only going to accelerate even more. Um, but we are seeing, a, a, as, as, as the other speakers have mentioned as well, sort of pockets of Australia and the region that are just not excluded. And that's that's actually not getting better, it's getting worse. Um, and one of the things that we have done is because there are so many things out there, what we wanted to do was to get um, really good data, really good research into how we could actually make the great, have the greatest impact. And many years ago, we started funding um, some research that's produced with, by, by RMIT and Swinburne Universities. Um, they produce this report each year, the Annual Digital Inclusion Index. And what it does, it's slightly different to the metrics that you mentioned, Andrew, but we assess digital inclusion on the basis of um, access, so digital access, um, digital affordability, um, but also digital ability. And that is that actually having both the physical ability that Bruce mentioned, but also um, the um, literacy, I yeah. guess, if you like. I think it picks up your literacy point. Um, and it looks at digital inclusion across those three dimensions. And the last report, which was produced in October last year, presents really quite stark findings for Australia. It is Australian data at the moment. That provides an opportunity in itself. But if you take some of the stats, um, 2.5 million Australians are not digitally connected. So that's one in 10 Australians. Wow. If you look at cohorts... Um, of kids out of a low, low, really low income homes, 800,000 secondary, secondary school students are not digitally included. And that can be one of those three reasons. Either they can't, their families can't afford it, um, they don't have access because um, they live in areas that are either remote and not connected, um, or they can't afford to be connected, um, or they don't have the ability to actually use the connections that they could otherwise get. That's an extraordinary number of students, really, when you think about it. Um, the other group, and there has been some slight improvement in this group, thankfully, but the other group as of October last year was um, the over 65-year-olds who were the least digitally included group in Australia, and that um, presented some real challenges for them when we saw a lot of Australia go into, you know, isolated living conditions and you had, you know, a significant number of them, it was actually one in five of them um, that weren't digitally connected. So what we've done is we take that research and we try and design some projects around that. Once again, these projects at the moment are only Australian based, but I think there's an opportunity there. And to give you a flavour of some of the projects, we've got um, Access for Everyone, which is a project that supports people suffering financial hardship. Um, we have a program called Safe Connections, which supports women and children who are experiencing family and domestic violence. Um, and that's including by giving them phones that um, the people, the offenders, can't actually access. Um, we uh, have some programs for, focused on digital literacy. So there's the Tech Savvy Seniors. Um, get one guess who that's focused on. And then also the digi Deadly Digital Communities. And so this is some work that we do in, in, digital, in Indigenous communities. And the name, was ca name came, um, came out of some of these projects that we've done in Queensland and the Northern Territory. 
Finally, we've also got a foundation and the foundation, our Telstra foundation is separate to Telstra um, and it runs um, a broad range of projects, but what its, its purpose really is to drive social change through technology. And so there's a broad range of projects that they support. Um, I think that sort of should give you a flavour of the type of things. That's all local, like it's local data, local uh, local experiences. But I think um, I, I get quite excited about the opportunity to take some of the experiences that we see in, our, in the Indo-Pacific region and see if we can do something there. And if you look at um, a disability like unaddressed hearing loss, um, the World Health Organisation has estimated that unaddressed hearing loss costs the world, in economic terms, almost a billion dollars a year. Mm. And that's not even taking into account the impacts like the social um, and productivity impacts and general happiness impacts um, of the people that are affected by unaddressed hearing loss. And the, one of the programs that um, was the, one of the digital startups that I mentioned from that remarkable accelerator program was specifically designed to pick up unaddressed hearing loss in ch school children um, with their Sound Scouts app. And so these people got together and developed an, a, a games-based app that it can be used for children to identify whether or not they have any hearing loss. That's been so successful, it's now offered free by the Australian government to all um, school children, and it's funded not by us any longer, it's fund, funded through philanthropic and, and government means. Um, so it's been an extraordinary success. Um, I think just to sort of go back to the question rather than my examples, but when I sort of sit back and think about it, I think, how can we actually do something? So what's my, when, when I think about what's my call to action, um, and I think about what it is we actually need uh, to have a greater impact on our, in our region. Um, and I think we need, we need the research. So we need the research to sort of tell us where we can best um, have an impact. I think we need innovations to take that research and turn it into really useful products, programs, services and the like. Um, we need the skills and that's where the STEM becomes critical and we're absolutely experiencing the same sort of thing where we're suffering from a, a lack, of, lack of skills in the area and the universities are really struggling to keep up. Uh, and we need capital. And when I look at those four things, I think the Indo-Pacific region is full of all of them. So we've got some of the best academic research in the world. Um, we've got great innovators that can come up. You've heard some examples of products and services today, but there's great innovators that can come up with really good things. Um, we've got the universities that can provide the school skills and the training, and we've got the capital. But I think what we're missing is that ecosystem, and an ecosystem that includes corporates, governments, academia, and right across our region. And that's where I see the NCP has, and scholars have really such an important part. You've had you know, the breadth of experience, the connections, and that really broad perspective that I think will be really useful to bring this all together and create that ecosystem. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's, so, it's great to hear such a strong commitment from leaders in the industry. And as a young person, it's just, I, I love the, the statistics. And one thing that I've come across in my work with SNAC is a, a UNICEF statistic that's two thirds of the world's school age population still have limited access to internet. Mm. And when you put it on, on that stage, it, it really, uh, I think in Australia, specifically in Sydney, um, we, we, we do take some of this digital um, experience for granted. And uh, so thank you. I, I think that concludes our panel discussion for this evening. However, now would be a great opportunity to turn to the audience in the room and online uh, for any questions for our panel. So we have some microphones roving. If you could just raise your hand if you have any questions or contributions or comments. And also, we, uh, if you're watching online on the live stream, uh, drop a comment and, and we'll be able to answer your questions as they come through. Hi, thank you for um, the great panel discussion. My name is Johnny, and my question revolves around how we can create, uh, I guess, grassroots change alongside institutional change. So we've sort of heard from Telstra and Infosys about the various things that we do on the institutional level, so where we do have access to that amazing research, the resources that go into this sort of thing. 
looking at all the people in the room today as well, I'm sure there's a lot of people out there that might not necessarily come through institutional channels, but would also like to contribute towards digital inclusion. What are some, I guess, of your call to actions for them? What can they be doing to be part of this movement? Um, thanks for the question, Johnny. I think one of the one of the things about grassroots, and you're right, you know, some some of this can come through large institutions. Some people don't work with large institutions, or they're not involved. Um, and I mentioned before that um, to me, it's it's it, there's business, government, academia, but also the not for profits as well. And I think something that you know has always been a, a grassroots of what we do in, in an institution has been the aspect of volunteering. And I think that can be done through some of the not-for-profit organisations so at a grassroots level. And I think one of the greatest um, things, and you know, some of our got a number of emphasis people sitting in the room here who've been involved in it, is mentoring. And you know, you've all had a tremendous experience over the last couple of years um, to find that situation where maybe you can go and help someone who's, you know, a disadvantage, got less opportunities than that, and to help mentor them along the way and just share your experiences and help them think it through. I think that's one way of, you know, sort of grassroots um, help that can be done. And the other is the thing about inclusion and the, the comments I made before about culture. It's, it's a mindset and it's a mindset um, that we need to grow in our society to for people to understand, you know, Yes, there's some challenges, but there's a big opportunity. As, as Bruce said, people are people, you know, regardless of what they've got. So I think you can, you can help with the, the mindset and the culture shift. You can help with, with volunteering and, and potentially help with mentoring. And that can be from anywhere. You don't need to be part of a big institution to do any of that. I might just check, Bruce, did you have any comments on that particular question? Yeah, look, I, 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 I think that that's that, that's uh, that, that's that's right. But I, I think one of the one of the um, really great things about the kind of technology that's 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 coming through now, and in fact that, that we have now, is that uh, anyone can try it. So if you have a, an iPhone, if you have an Android phone, you can experience what it's like to use uh, the voiceover screen reader. Or what it's like to use the the you know the screen magnification um, sort of software in the in the phone because because there is a you know screen reader vo uh, uh, the voiceover screen reader in every iPhone that you buy uh, sort of off the shelf. So the more people that the more people that try those things just to get just to get a feel for you know for what it's like, then the more likely it is that when you know when they develop apps when they develop websites they'll be thinking about well, how how someone who's using this voiceover screen reader going to access going to access um, you know my you know my website or my uh, or my app? I think the other the other thing is to to have that inclusive um, inclusion you know mindset, inclusive design. Um, any any products and services that you're involved with designing, ask about inclusion. Give some thought to how 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 are the diverse range of people that. That, that make up our, our society going to you know going to use those things whether it's a whether it's an app whether it's a website or whether it's a you know whether it's a product the organizations that you 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 work in certainly um, inclusion inclusion has to be you know embedded into the you know into the corporate culture and, and that can be done from you know from the top down but it can also happen from you know, from the to the bottom up. So I, I think for me the, the 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 key thing is to start thinking inclusively and and apply that thinking to everything you do. Thanks, I think, Bruce. Johnny, the only thing I'd add, and it picks up on something that Bruce just mentioned, um, in slightly different language, but I'd also give us a nudge. I'd keep giving us a nudge. I think corporates and governments, for that matter, um, are surprisingly uh, conscious of what the community thinks and says. So I wouldn't give, give up on giving us a nudge in the right direction with your great ideas. Thank you. Are there any other questions from the audience? Uh, hi, my name's Morgan. I'm a current NCP scholar for this year. 
And um, I guess something that I was really interested in was I think the biggest issue with bridging digital disparities is the pace in which technology advances. So what I've found, I work in like a IT support role to consumers and it's mostly the older generations that call up for assistance, you know, very basic things. But what I often find is that they, once they've gotten knowledge about something, that knowledge is suddenly eclipsed by something new that's come on the horizon or that's currently in practice. So I'm just curious to think, to hear what your thoughts would be on that matter to try and kind of bridge that gap in knowledge. Uh, sure, Lindel. There you go. Okay, okay. Um, Morgan. Thank you. Um, and look, I, I recognise the point you pick up on. It's um, a good one. And I think you you talked before about the over sixty five yep. age group, and and you're right. You you just get to learn how to use something, and then a new version comes out, and you're completely lost. Um, and yeah, actually, you know, the, the comment I was I was making before about mentoring, I was more thinking about that, but um, actually helping some of the over 65s and group with that is something that, that we can all do. But this thing about technology constantly evolving, it, it, it's very real and everyone, um, all of us, I mean, even at Emphasis, um, one of the things we're doing with our technology is, is constantly relearning and reskilling. Um, I talked before a little bit about our program um, called Pathways. And actually what it's doing is using technology and a heritage of learning capabilities to help create small bite-sized, and you talked before about bite-sized um, education opportunities for people to learn. So we're using that to reskill our organisation because technology changes. We're working with a lot of our customers to help those customer organisations reskill, but that's also part of that, that CSR program and that initiative to help others is to relearn education. Um, now that's for, the more we have digital skills and a digital culture and you know, getting, as I said before, getting behind the scenes of technology as a society, the more that problem will start to be dealt with. But I do recognise particularly with the older generation and I think that's something you know, we, should, we should help the older generation with. It's not an, not an easy challenge um, versus all of you who've grown up as digital natives. Uh, Andrew, just to, sorry, just to go yeah, deep sure. before we jump to, whose responsibility is that to, to upskill? Is it the government? Is it the private sector? Is it um, the academia to reach out and and provide you know new education solutions? Who who do you think uh, holds responsibility for for that? I think the answer is it's all of us, and and it won't you know government can't do it on its own. Mm -hmm. Industry can't do it on it, academia can't do it. I really believe it's all of us. And that's why, you know, I talked before about the Digital Telecommunications Committee looking at 2030. It, it involves people from business, it involves people from government, it involves people from some of the universities. And I think that's something we've suffered from in the past. Um, it, it hasn't... Um, hasn't been connected up particularly well and we need to get better at that. You know, I just talked before a bit about micro-learning. One of, one of the things is to continue to in, involve lifelong education and there's a lot of discussion about micro-credentials. Mm -hmm. um, now, that's something that everyone, business, government and academia, has to buy into. OK, we're going to have micro-credentials. You might, someone at Infosys might learn something about the latest version of Apple or whatever it is and you've got a credential for that and then the next year you can go and be employed by Telstra and they'll recognise that credential. Or you can be at UTS, I think you, you mentioned, you, know, you can be at UTS and you learn something there mm -hmm. and it can be bite-sized learning. So, but what, you know, it's everyone together. That's the only way it's really, really going to make a difference and get us up those big mountains. Mm. Thank you. Lyndall, do you have anything to I'll just check in. Uh, Bruce or Arun, would you like to make any comment there? I, um, I, I might spin off a little bit from, from that and look at you know, look at um, technology and the and, and the rapid evolution of technology and how that impacts on, on on digital inclusion from an accessibility sort of point of view. Um, certainly, you know, certainly technology is is evolving much faster than 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 the standards that that uh, sort of mandate accessibility. When you when you talk about standards development, think you know, think glaciers. When you talk about technological evolution, think melting of the polar ice caps. And and and. What that means is that we can't rely simply on technical technical standards to, to, to guarantee accessibility, and that's where it, that's that's where it comes back to the inclusive, you know, to the inclusive mindset. One of the biggest challenges that, that those of us who are blind or have low vision face at the moment is that is is the rapid um, uh, deployment of touchscreen based uh, sort of interfaces on everything from you know from coffee machines to dishwashers to 
to um, ICT products and, and even, uh, ironically enough, digital digital pianos. And and very few of those, with the exception of of, of the you know, some smartphones, uh, have accessibility built in, and that's uh, that's mm. that's partly because there are no there are no standards for how you make um, touchscreen coffee machines accessible. But it's also because there's not an inclusive mindset. So the mm. developers of the coffee machines, the developers of the digital pianos, are not thinking um, how do I make these products accessible so that people with, you know, who are blind or have low vision and indeed have other disabilities can access them. So I I, I think the the, as technology evolves faster and faster, the need for a, a, an inclusive uh, mindset becomes more critical. Thank you, Bruce. <laughs> can I the only thing, can I just add one thing to your question about whose responsibility is it? <laughs> and from my perspective, I think we should ask ourselves what world, what sort of world do we, what sort of society do we want to live in? And that sort of determines whose responsibility it is. And for me, that that is what motivates me to do something about it. Great. Thank you. Um, I think we have time for one more question. Uh, I just have a question come through from WebEx, and it's slightly more specific. Um, how, I guess it's building on the, the senior citizen uh, discussion, and how do we ensure that we get the bite-sized learning that we've been talking about to smaller regional communities of specifically our elder citizens? Does anybody... Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll have a go. I'll yeah. kick off. I'll, like. I'll add. So I think um, that it's kind of... Um, we've had a lot of success with our... I mentioned the Tech Savvy Seniors Digital Literacy Program and the Deadly, Dig, sorry, Deadly Digital Communities Program. I always struggle over that one. It's kind of a combination of those two things, right? So these programs are really simple literacy programs, digital literacy programs that are run out of local communities, halls, local libraries, within schools, um, wherever they're, whatever makes sense within a community. And really that's all they actually are, is actually making sure that people have the ability to use all of the technology that is actually available to them. Mm -hmm. Part of the challenge though, particularly in remote communities in Australia, is that there's not always great technology available yep. to them, but I think we do, we have had some se success in helping people better use the technology that's available to them. Sure. Thank you. I think uh, that's a great way to wrap up our question and answer time. I'd now like to invite Julia Niblett, the New South Wales State Director of the New Colombo Plan uh, from the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade to close the session for us tonight. Thank you very much. So thank you very much, Cody. Thank you for chairing this very informative and really interesting session so well. I thought the questions you asked were fantastic oh. and I'm really glad that uh, I was able to be privy to hearing uh, so much about what the um, activities are, um, the focus of the private sector, but also the kind of challenges, especially in the disability sector, um, that need to focus our minds on how we guarantee digital inclusion. So I want to thank our guests, our sponsors and the NCP community for your attendance today. And I just want to say on behalf of the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, um, thanks in particular to the panellists. Um, your contributions were great. And I also want to thank you in particular for your commitment to supporting the NCP Momentum um, series. Thank you so much for that. To Lyndall, Lyndall Stoyles, who's the Group General Counsel and Group Executive of Sustainability at Telstra. Uh, Andrew Groth, Senior Vice President, Region Head Australia and New Zealand, and Industry Head Financial Services Asia Pacific Infosys. That's a big business card you need for all of that. And you got a digital one, perfect. And to Bruce McGuire, Lead Policy Advisor, um, Vision Australia, uh, New South Wales. Um, I really was struck by a couple of things that were said. Lyndall talked about opportunities in the region uh, that we call the Indo-Pacific. And I just want to mention to you all that I returned to Australia last year from my role as Australia's High Commissioner to Bangladesh. I was very proud in that role to promote Australia's engagement in the area of digital inclusion. And we did that in a number of ways, but in particular, 
we supported a lot of programs for women and girls, digital literacy and digital inclusion for women and girls. So DFAT funded, for example, the development of an app uh, to provide information on emergency services that were available for women victims of acid violence. It's a terrible thing that happens in South Asia, but we helped develop this app that provided information as well on e-clinics for medical, legal and psychosocial support to acid burn survivors. And that was a great example of innovation and it provided a lot of support to, to victims. We also worked very well with an NGO called Girl Effect that's run out of the, uh, the UK, you may have heard of it, to develop mobile research technology. Um, we wanted to work with them to develop uh, some technology that would enable um, young women, adolescent women, adolescents and young women, to undertake research um, and listen to other girls' uh, views, um, you know, their peers, um, to hear about their aspirations and challenges and what they really were wanting to do, to give them an avenue for expressing these things without having to sort of run things past their parents all the time. They could actually talk amongst their peers. Um, and it was a great thing to have these technology-enabled girl ambassadors go out to young women in the community. We also supported the strengthening of institutional capacity uh, using technology to support a lot of people with, um, with limited abilities. Um, but also digital literacy is so vital uh, because of its value in uh, managing businesses and working through e-commerce and really sharpening some of the opportunities for women entrepreneurs and in particular women farmers. Uh, and so being able to be part of this digital skilling up was really uh, transformative. Um, here in the DFAT New South Wales State Office, and I've got some of my colleagues here tonight, uh, we're very keen to build working relationships, um, not just with the private sector, of course that's really important to learn a bit more about what you're doing, but also to develop those relationships with NGOs such as Vision Australia. Um, and I was particularly struck by uh, uh, Bruce's commentary and I thought your um, focus on um, inclusive design and innovation was a lesson for all of us those that provide services, and it prompted me to think about some of the services that DFAT provides, but also other government agencies, how we need to always have um, an inclusive uh, approach to design. Um, but we also are really glad to build connections to uh, support NGOs that are involved in similar sorts of community projects um, and to identify those that could be useful to connect with or be of interest to the NCP community, uh, including NCP scholars. So from that point of view, it actually has expanded my horizons a little bit and given me some things to think about. Um, I really liked um, Andrew's reference to um, opportunities for mentoring and for uh, volunteering, which I think is a fantastic um, suggestion for all of us. Um, and I guess I feel a bit reassured about the pace of change of technology, that it isn't just me that has to think all the time about having to learn new skills and upgrade things, but I'm very encouraged by the fact that not only is it a reality for everyone, even in the profession, in the industry, but also that you have strategies to help people um, snack on microbytes of uh, new knowledge that helps uh, everybody become more... Um, um, better functioning, better users of digital uh, technology. So I hope you all found the session as interesting as I did. I found it really exciting and I was really pleased to hear your views. I'm wondering if I could ask you all to please join me in thanking our panellists and our subject matter experts for sharing their insights and for sh showcasing their digital inclusion projects that they continue to invest in and support both here in Australia and overseas, and to thank Cody in particular for great chairing and great probing. I thought that was fantastic. So please join me to thank everyone.